we have in, our, in all of our cells, with few exceptions, DNA. And every generation, sperm and egg pass on DNA. The DNA changes. There's mistakes that happen. It's not copied perfectly. Well, that means it's a, it's a regular process. And so to have a clock, all you need is a regular repeating process. Every generation, changes happen. So we don't appreciate it because we live, we see two, three generations, we die. Well, you add this up over several hundred generations, you're, there's a history that's recorded. And so if we look at the DNA of people around the globe, we look at the DNA of animals around the globe, how many differences exist, how fast does it change, we've got a clock, a mathematical calculation we can use and say, do species, do humans look young? Do we have a lot of genetic differences? Has the clock been ticking for a long time or a short time? And over and over again, what we see in our DNA is abundant evidence. There isn't enough DNA differences for us to have been around hundreds of thousands, millions of years. It looks like we arose just 6,000 years ago. If you go back 40 years in the creation evolution debate, what's the main argument against creation? What's, in, what's ensconced in federal law? Why can't creation, si creation science be taught in the classroom? Well, it's not science. It doesn't make testable predictions. That's flat out false. Developments in seismology have progressed and we've, we can now use seismic tomography to look in, essentially into the interior of the Earth. And what was found was very large areas of cold, relatively cold rock, cold relative to the surrounding mantle, that extend under subduction zones and reach the top of the Earth's core. They go all the way down through the mantle. And this has been a real puzzle to conventional geology. How can this be explained? But this was a prediction from the modified catastrophic version of plate tectonics. But some of the famous ones, like I, when I first uh, um, saw Bob Inyar before we became friends, I saw a debate that he had had with Eugenie Scott back in 1998. And he had asked her, what are your three best evidences for evolution? She only mentioned one, she didn't mention three, she mentioned one, and it was junk DNA. And Bob said at that time, I predict that over time we will find that that junk isn't junk DNA. So we all know that that's been proven true, right, the junk, that there's no junk DNA. I don't have to uh, show a slide on that, you can go check on the internet, check secular sources, there's no junk, the junk DNA is pretty much gone. The Hubble deep uh, field images would look like nearby galaxies. That was one we predicted, and sure enough, when the Hubble deep scope deep uh, field uh, images came in, we saw galaxies with the spiral arms, and they shouldn't have those spiral arms anymore if they're really old, right? Because Newton's laws, the stars wind up being like a clock screen, you shouldn't have it. The evolutionists call that the winding up problem. So he made a prediction. He said, imagine we have a lava flow. This was in 1986, paper published in 1986. So imagine we have a lava flow at the Earth's surface. We know that in lava flows, we have minerals which are magnetic and which record the prevailing direction of the Earth's magnetic field. So he said, imagine this lava flow at the Earth's surface, and here we have the prevailing direction of the Earth's magnetic field. The magnetic minerals in the lava begin to line up according to that direction but of course lava flows don't cool all at the same time the outer part of the lava flow cools first while the in innermost part of the lava flow remains warm so what would happen now if a rapid reversal happened while this lava flow was forming so magnetic re field reversal occurs in the part of the lava flow which has already cooled, those magnetic minerals are frozen into place. Okay, so they freeze and they, they record the previous direction of the magnetic field. But in the part of the lava flow which is still molten, these minerals realign themselves with the new direction. So what you'd end up with is a lava flow that preserves a magnetic reversal. Now, in conventional plate tectonics, Nobody expects to see this because a thin lava flow cools very quickly. But a magnetic reversal is meant to take place over a much longer time period than it takes for a single lava flow to cool. So in conventional plate tectonics where these things are happening slowly, nobody expects to see this.
But Russ Humphreys said, if this flood model of plate tectonics is correct, then we ought to be able to find somewhere lava flows that record a magnetic field reversal happening. Well, in 1989, a group of geologists, not creationists, were studying basalt lava flows, Miocene lava flows at Steens Mountain in Oregon. And they found a lava flow which they estimated had cooled within a period of two weeks, 14 days, and it recorded a substantial part of a magnetic reversal. They were astonished. They didn't even really believe it themselves. So they went back and they collected more data because they thought they must have made some kind of mistake. And they found that not only were they able to confirm their results, they felt that the magnetic reversal had actually happened a bit faster than they originally thought. This was published in 1995 in the journal Nature. So again, here is a creationist prediction that was made back in 1986 and was subsequently confirmed by the data. If I failed to use the word isolated in the prediction section, I, I should have, okay? Um, in the long essay that I've written on the Cambrian explosion with uh, uh, Paul Nelson, and Paul Chen, I, I know we made that point strongly, and it was also expressed in the very controversial article I wrote that was published uh, at the Smithsonian's journal. Mutation and selection are not sufficient to produce the information, the new genes and proteins you would need to build Cambrian animals. And his point is precisely that the, um, that the functional proteins are extremely rare in sequence space and that they are isolated. There was a kind of obvious problem. If a gene is a section of something like dig digital code or something like a section of alphabetic text and you begin to degrade it at random by mutation um, or you begin to change it at random, it raises a question. Uh, is it more likely that you will degrade that initial, func initial function or add to it as mutation progresses? Um, as you map sequence space um, in some of the ways that Axe and others have done, it becomes possible to say, well, how many mutational changes can be absorbed in this process before you begin to lose the kind of function that is necessary to keep a gene in, in, in op 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 operation. Well, let me, let me finish. Here, here's an illustration. Imagine you've got a, a sentence at the this, at this top, and the question is, can you get from one sentence through, but you start to degrade it, you know, time and tide wait for no man, and then you've got a section, a sentence from Stephen Jay Gould. Are you going to, by degrading the initial information, are you going to be able to pass through a series of functional intermediates and then get to another meaningful, another meaningful uh, sentence? In the protein world, it requires a continuous series of functional folds. And that's what Dr. Axe is, is questioning in his work, that, there, that it's not structurally possible to get from one stable folding motif to another, and there are other labs that are finding the same thing. We usually don't think that the Bible has scientific data in it, but it, there is uh, one set of data in the Bible which is clearly um, scientific and very, very interesting. It has to do with how long people lived, starting from Noah and to the present. Uh, the nine generations before Noah and Noah were all living, people were living to be over 900 years old, according to scripture. And we're gonna look at the scriptural evidence and then the genetic evidence. But scripturally speaking, uh, we can plot lifespan of the patriarch versus how many generations since Noah. And what we see is uh, that uh, Noah lived to be 950 years old, but his son, Shem, poor guy, died at only 600, and that a few generations later, Abraham died at 175, and a few generations after Abraham, Moses died at 120, and uh, a number of generations after Moses, King David died 70. I can relate to that. I just turned 70. And uh, lastly, uh, the average Roman citizen 
um, longevity was 45 years. So um, what we see here is an incredible biological decay curve and uh, it's stunning. And uh, it, it, it turns out the, the, the main players of the Bible uh, fall exactly on the same line and that uh, the other, all the other patriarchs uh, recorded in the Bible where we have the lifetime, their lifespan, uh, all fall very tightly on that. So this one in March 2012, we had an article in our hands on this lake that they found in Antarctica. They discovered it and it was two miles under the surface. So now because it's so far down, they think it's been sealed off and there's been a, a 15 million years have gone by. So what a great laboratory experiment for evolution, okay? Because 15 million years have gone by. They claim we evolved from a chimp-like creature five million years ago. So this is three times longer than when they claim that we evolved from a simian ancestor, okay? So they're expecting to find all kinds of evolution, all kinds of adaptation into that environment that fits the evolutionary paradigm. So we made a prediction that that's, they're just gonna find everyday life in that lake. So, here we go, July 7, 2013. This gets published. They finally had a look at all this stuff. And here's what they found. I'll show you an excerpt from the article. Okay. Many of the species we sequenced are what we would expect to find in a lake. Most of the organisms appear to be aquatic, freshwater, and many species that usually live in the ocean or lake sediments. All they found were modern day life forms. That go, that's an evolutionary prediction that did not come true and a creation prediction that did come true. This is something I did a number of years ago to test whether the evolutionary claim was true that the evolutionary tree of organisms is uh, shown or proven by the fossil record. I had heard a number of my professors through time say the fossils show the order of evolution. What they meant was that in the evolutionary tree, the appearance, the order of branching that evolution says occurred is reflected in the order that those groups of organisms first appeared in the fossil record. So I set about to test that. In order to test it, you've got to first of all create the evolutionary tree. So I used the best uh, information that was available at the time to create an evolutionary tree of all organisms. In this case, I'm going to be looking just at the orders and above. Uh, and this is part of that evolutionary tree, but this part down here called eukaryotic kingdoms, there's more to the tree that I can't fit on here. So we look at that tree, and there's two more branches on that tree that I can't fit on here. So you need to stick the plants in there, and you need to stick the animals in there. So you've got a very big tree. Now once you've done that, you can then uh, look at this tree and determine, predict from it, what the order of branching should be. It should be that the tree started down here and made its way out to the final result. When you do that and lay them all out, you find that actually the order of branching predicted by evolution from this tree doesn't really correspond with the order of branching that you find uh, in, uh, in the fossil record, or I should say with the order of first appearance in the fossil record. In other words, when evolution says this group should have come first, that's not usually the, the first group in the fossil record. The 5% that does seem to correspond happens to be in groups where evolution says this group evolved from sea to land. So for example, it says that the plants evolved from the sea to land, and the plant groups seem to come into the, into the fossil record in the same order that evolution says it they should. Uh, the land animals are thought to have evolved from the sea and they come in in the order that evolution predicts they should come in. So it appears that there's evidence for the most part of randomness but the only pattern that really has to be explained is a sea to land transition. 
In addition to looking at it from an evolutionary perspective, you could also ask a different question. What order would you predict them to come in if you arrange them from sea to land? What if you considered the plants that have to have standing water to reproduce at one end of the spectrum and then put them side by side as per how much water they need to survive, all the way up to animals that can survive even in, let's say, desert environments. It, <clears throat> when you put them in a, an order of what might be called terrestriality, from non-terrestrial to terrestrial, you get a pattern like you have at the right. Now the pattern at the right looks very similar to the pattern at the left, uh, extremely similar. Uh, it's not quite the same, but from this you can then predict a pattern of branching that evolution would predict and a pattern of branching that ecology would predict if these things were arranged from sea to land. And you can compare those and do another, uh, do more statistics, you basically get the same pattern. In other words, evolution can predict the pattern, but also another thing that could have produced the pattern is if the plants were actually lined up from sea to land with uh, increasing terrestriality. Is that amazing to find this kind of soft tissue in a fossil this old? And what can the soft tissue really tell us? Um, well, it is, it is, it's very amazing. It's uh, utterly shocking, actually, because it flies in the face of everything that we understand about how tissues and cells degrade. Uh, it's not something that any one of us could ever predict or hope for. Um, and I, I think that it's important to remember that we we don't know for sure what it still is. It looks like blood vessels, and it looks like um, bone matrix, and it certainly looks like cells, and it acts like cells, but we haven't done the chemical analysis that let us say what it is for sure. And the way they phrase it, the way they apply it, is maybe the better way to say it, is there are certain expectations they have if evolution were true. In practice, it's a really plastic theory, and I can give examples of evolutionists from the 50s saying, well, we know evolution's been going on for millions of years, and so it's hopeless to find shared DNA among species. It's just been going on for too long. Mistakes have been happening too long. That's a prediction, expectation of evolution. Lo and behold, we find that mice and fruit flies use a similar section of DNA to build their eyes, even though a fruit fly has a compound eye and a mouse has an eye like ours. Well, we've just falsified evolution, evolution haven't we? We've just found the opposite of what evolutions have expected. No, that's now the textbook evidence for common ancestry. So evolution predicts one thing, the opposite is found. Well, now that's the fulfillment of the prediction of evolution. And these sorts of things happen below the radar in technical journals, and most people don't see it, but this is the reality of evolution. And, and really, evolution isn't testable. It isn't predictable. If it can explain polar opposite conclusions and both of them be, both of them be confirmation of evolution, you can't have it both ways is really what it comes down to. But evolutionists want to have it both ways, and they call those predictions when, when in fact evolution is an idea that, after the fact, explains everything. And of course, if you can explain everything after the fact by storytelling, you don't explain anything.